Time and Tide by Miss Demina 1331 Chapter 2 Hermione was mired in drowsy half-consciousness. It was not a calm, gentle waking from sleep. Her awareness crept in like a lover, caring and quiet. It was instead a hangover stupor, with full body pain and a nauseating curl in her brain and gut. The space behind her eyelids was too bright to bear, the darkness too crushing to stand. And here she was, trapped in limbo, the worst of both worlds. Her foot twitched, an instinctive response like a horse flicking its tail to dislodge a bothersome fly. The tinkle moved up her leg, more meaner than a focused exploration. Then, a jump that helped to wake her, hands against her side, encircling her waist, fingers rubbing so circles against her skin. Money moaned. She tried to move away, but only managed to roll her neck, face angled towards the light, and she grimaced at the sting of it. The hands continued their journey north, skimming the bones of her torso, tracing the bottom edge of her breasts. No. Adrenaline shot through her system, and she pried her eyes open. Her assailant was a thin man dressed in dark denims and an old sweater. He had a sharp chin, and his jawline was dusted with a shadow of stubble. He had pulled his platinum blonde hair back into a small, sloppy bun. No! Draco Malfoy looked down at her from over his shoulders, his grey eyes narrowed and assessing. He held her sealskin in his hands. What were you doing at the well? His voice was barely above a whisper, but it felt like a shout to a pounding head. The stunner still had her in its grip. She frowned and turned her head away. She needed space to think, to strategize. He dropped her skin, and the absence of his fingers flooded her with short-lived relief. His boots thudded across the wood floor, and she flinched away from the edge of one as he straddled her. He strapped his supine from between his legs, looking down at her from standing. The well, he repeated. He shook her head or tried to. The motion was jerky, her neck still stiff from the curse. He squatted down slowly so that she could feel the horror of his approach. Witnessed the full force of the menace behind his eyes, which were as dead and dull as the scale of a beached fish. His hand drifted to her neck, the web between his thumb and forefinger settling just below her chin. He applied pressure, enough to show he meant it. I will not ask again. She tried to lift her leg, to knee him, grab her skin and make a run for it. Her heel only scraped across the floor. He noted it with a raised brow. You think I haven't done this before? The pressure on her larynx increased. You think I don't know how long the effects of a stunner last, how to get information out of someone who doesn't want to give it? He leaned down, their noses almost brushing. You think I give a shite about you, Granger? No. She choked and jerked her head forward. But he was too quick, or she was too slow. He flinched clear, his hand leaving her neck just long enough for her to swallow a painful breath. Then, a new world of pain. A backhand to her cheek that left her seeing stars. She gasped, tasting blood, and blinked away her doubled vision. He gripped her chin, sending a jaw through her tender jaw as he faced her forward. That will not help you, he growled. The well. Praying, she said, forcing the answer past his hand. It wasn't technically a lie. Bullshit. He'd seen a truth behind her eyes. Maybe he knew her well enough to know that she had no need for gods, modern or mythological. Oh, magic? He tried again. He cut her off. Perhaps you're misunderstanding your circumstances. Your prisoner, Granger. My prisoner. If you tell me what I want to know, I will kill you quickly. If not... His dull eyes brightened, and he stroked a long finger across her cheek, a clear and convincing thread. If not, I will break you first and then your back for it. Tears pricked the corner of her eyes. Not from fear. She'd been in worse scrapes. But she knew Draco of old. Intelligent, just behind her in every class except for potions. 
a keen strategist who had gotten the Death Eaters into Hogwarts under the nose of the headmaster, the professors, and Harry's suspicious eyes. A decent duelist, the stories of his battlefield performances discussed at length in those early days, when any hesitation could be exploited as weakness. But at his core, Draco was a coward, a man who lacked the courage to follow through with his threats. She could use that to her advantage, use his weakness to save herself. A tear slipped free and dripped into her hair, tested to motion and strengthened her legs via a brief panicked scrum. She needed to lay for as long as it took her legs to regain the strength to run. Please! Draco's lip curled in disgust as she begged, her voice now not only a choke but thick with grief. Please! She said, another tear sipping loose. I went to wish, just to wish. Draco paused as something caught his attention, a sound she couldn't hear. His eyes shifted towards the door. Shite! Malfoy, please, quiet. You, you don't have to. I said quiet. Another step, though not as hard as the first, intended to focus a babbling woman, not disorient a non-compliant prisoner. She obeyed, tensing as he looked back down at her. Do you want to survive today? She nodded. Then get up. His hand dropped from around her throat and he stepped back, wand trained on her chest as she struggled to her feet. She moved slower than necessary, giving herself time to take an inventory. Draco had brought her to a small detached house. She'd woken in the front sitting room. Moth-eaten curtains had been pulled over the windows, throwing incomplete shade over a threadbare couch, a single armchair and a fireplace. Several manual locks barred the front door. Amani assumed that they were charmed as well, though she couldn't be sure until she tested them. With a snap of his fingers, Draco summoned ropes around her wrists, binding her hands together behind her back, he took her arm and marched her through the house, past a spot and dining set, a small kitchen, and into a dark hallway. Past the first room on the left, the door cracked open far enough to allow a glimpse of dirty clothes and empty air can scattered across the floor. Past a pair of opposing doors, a linen closet on the left, and, judging from the fusty smell, a cellar on the right. At the end of the hall, also on the right, was a water closet. Draco paused at the last door on the left and held his hand against the knob. It looked orange, as if the metal had been thrust into a blacksmith's forge. After a moment, it cooled back to brass. He shoved her through first and closed it behind them. The smell of him was stronger here. Spice like whiskey and the musk of unwashed sheets. He kept his room tidy. No clothes or detritus on the floor. His bed was unmade, but his corner desk was organized with no incriminating pieces of parchment for her to filch. He slid open his closet door, where black robes hung next to chunky sweaters and a few oxfords. His trousers had been pressed and carefully hung. His vanity, at least, had survived the war. Before she could make a smart comment about it, he shoved her forward. With another snap of his fingers, a blindfold wrapped around her eyes. Not a word, yes, not a single sound, or else you're through. Not if you understand. She nodded. Draco sounded scared, or perhaps concerned was more accurate. Whatever was about to happen worried him, and she had no idea why. He'd shown no concern for her survival earlier. In fact, he promised to make her beg for death. What had changed? And what did it mean for her chances of escape? The ambient light beyond her blindfold disappeared as he slid the closet door closed. He opened his bedroom door, stepped into the hallway, and closed her in. She shuffled to the corner and lowered herself to a seat, keeping her back against the wall and using her feet to move his shoes and clear a space for herself. She pressed an ear to the wall, which was thin enough to hear through, and followed the sound of his footsteps. Draco moved around in the kitchen, closing cabinets. He had a faint rattle, which she suspected was the front door's many locks disengaging. Hermione hardly dared to breathe as a piece of understanding clicked into place. Draco was hiding her from his housemates, who he either didn't like, didn't trust, or both. Rao? Another piece slotted into place. Thorfinn Rao was a brute of a man, a nasty combination of cruel and careless. 
more than one Death Eater owed his untimely death to friendly fire originating from Raoul's wound, and she'd heard other rumors too, how he targeted female combatants, the sadistic spells he'd craft against them. His interest in taking them alive were never possible. It wasn't hard to guess what prompted such an interest. Maybe Draco had retained a shred of his humanity after all. Roll banged through the kitchen cabinets, muttering as he did. Smells in here like fish. Hermione and cold. She didn't notice the smell of the sea anymore, which hung around her seer skin like a miasma. She never considered how it could give her away. Where had Draco hidden it? Was it safe? We're four hundred yards from the coast. What do you expect? A beat of silence passed, then Raoul growled an unintelligible reply. Any news? Draco asked. None that you need to know. The pop hiss of an air can cracking open. Keep quiet. I was travelling all night. I need my rest. Is that an order? I turned silence. Give me a reason, boy. Raoul's voice was deep and threatening. The Dark Lord would thank me for it. Yes, I'm sure he'd be thrilled to have his primary source of funding becoming entirely uncooperative, Draco drawled. Quite a tactician you are, Raoul. Perhaps you should put in for a promotion, get yourself out of the evenness, shite-hole. We're both in this shite-hole, Raoul said pointedly. Now shut it. Heavy footsteps travelled down the hall, then Raoul's door slammed shut. Silence descended over the tiny house. There was the crunch of an air can being crushed, the thud of tossed boots and a muffled whoomp of discarded clothes. After about twenty minutes, Raoul began to snore, a rumble like truck tires or uneven pavement. The noise masked the sound of Draco's footstep as he ventured from the kitchen. Money was surprised when the bedroom door eased open, then clicked close again. The ambient light returned as Draco opened the closet door. Money winced as he magic the blindfold away. There's some brains in you after all, he whispered. He sat down across from her, her pack on his lap. He pulled the drawstrings apart, and Hermione's shoulders tingled as he withdrew her sealskin. Hermione's eyes drifted close at the sensation. It had been months since she'd been touched by someone. A life spent delivering the order's messages wasn't conducive to physical intimacy. She'd almost forgotten the pure human pleasure of it a pleasure that disappeared at his disgusted expression. Roll was right, this thing stinks. Nevertheless, he brought it closer, wrapping the thick fabric between his thumb and forefinger. Never seen anything like this, though. He looked up at her. What is it? Insulated cloak. He kept her answer casual, disinterested. If Daco knew what he held, the importance of it not only to the order, but to her life, she'd been in even greater danger. Draco looked sceptical, but didn't press. He set the skin aside, and Hermione relaxed a little, past the most immediate danger. For the next several hours, Draco took a complete inventory of Hermione's pack, throwing one item at a time. She had sacrificed her personal library to include only the most critical subject, a field healing manual and a four-inch thick encyclopedia of charms, curses, hexes, and jinxes. There were several maps of the British Isles, both topographical End of the surrounding ocean currents. More money pouch contained three sickles and a handful of knots. He scoffed upon emptying the pockets of her mag at the handful of muggle bills and coins contained therein. She carried nothing incriminating. Nothing that would give away the order or any of its confidential information. Been a spy for long. She bit her tongue, but Draco didn't seem to require an answer. You're careful, he said almost impressed. You're only useful so long as you're alive. It's strategic. Smart. Though perhaps I should have figured as much. If he hadn't been sneering, she might have taken it as a compliment. Now what? she asked. The question felt inevitable, but he looked surprised. She tilted her head toward Raoul's room. You can't hide me forever. Just until he leaves for the night, Draco said. Bright afternoon night filtered through the gap between his curtains. Night was still several hours away, and then to the Dark Lord. She had long since grown accustomed to the taboo on Lord Voldemort's proper name. His eyes narrowed. What does it matter to you? She forced a shrug, 
the muscles in her shoulders pinching. It's notable that you don't trust your colleague. Maybe there are others you don't trust. Maybe. He lunged forward, his hand connecting with her throat. She gasped as her head bounced off the closet door, eyes watering reflexively. Be silent, or I will silence you. Raoul gave a snort, sending them both into stillness. Lord Bedsprings creaked as he readjusted, and then his rhythmic snoring returned. Draco pulled his hand away. Not a sound. We packed everything except for the book of spells. She cringed as he handled her sealskin, shoving it carelessly atop all other items. Malfoy. He bared his teeth at her, practically hissing with displeasure. He asked regardless. Where is my wand? He tossed her pack onto his bed and joined it there, taking off his shoes before settling himself against a thin pillow propped against the wall. Malfoy! A casual flick of his wand made good on his promise. He silenced her. They traded a glare across the small bedroom and then Draco turned back to her book, flipping to her dog-eared pages and squinting as he tried to decipher the tiny notes and ideas she'd written in the margins. She settled herself against the closet door and closed her eyes, breathing through the pain in her jaw and head and a growing ache across her back and shoulder. She had been in worse situations, but not by much, and in those situations at least one other person had known her location. No one in the order knew where she was, only that she was headed to Everness and was due in Edinburgh in two days. No one would raise an alarm until day four of her absence. Day five would bring panic. By then, it would probably be too late. Draco could have a well across the country, handed over to Voldemort in his fortress on the Isle of Man. In six days, she'd be either a prisoner or a corpse. To be continued. Thank you for listening to this chapter of Time and Tide by Miss Demina 1331. If you would like to stay up to date on upcoming chapters and stories, you can follow me on YouTube, Spotify or AO3.